Welcome back to the NY Patriot Show. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, thank you, everybody who's been waiting in the uh, in the chat for the show to start. That's what's up. That's pretty cool. I appreciate that. Um, today's very exciting guest, and I truly mean that. Uh, and an exciting, yeah, and an exciting topic too, actually. Um, I had come across this show uh, later than I wish I had. Um, I had just recently. <laughs> Watched it, I think, a few months ago, but uh, I got the uh, headless giant. Um, he is Hello? yes, he is also a listener too of the show. So th- I mean, that's actually I mean that makes it special to me already. Is that I have somebody that listens to the show that's able to come on and cover a topic. That's what's up. I love that. You know. Well, it's special for me too because I'm going to hear myself and hear you. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, you'll be like, oh shit, that's the episode I just did with. Him. <laughs> that's great, right? Um, yeah, so we got the Headless Giant covering uh, uh, OA, and um, I know you don't have your own show yet, but uh, let people know where they can find you and plug any other shows that you have been on also. Well, you can find me on Instagram, at Headless Giant, and you can also find me on Twitter on there under Headless underscore Giant, and uh, I was also on General Lee's show talking about the same topic gotcha gotcha sorry about that i was uh, trying to fix the audio yeah so and, right. and, and if you want i will get the links from uh general lee's show as well and i will put that in the bottom uh with this so people can check that out as well because i'm sure you may not say the same thing uh exactly word for word on here that you did on there so you know there could be tidbits of different things so maybe if you listen to both of them you'll get even a broader sense you know so exactly yes well i wanted to go over a few definitions first yes please Um, yes let's do that first thing uh you and me we're not humans we're actually human shaped donuts and a lot of people don't understand this we've got a hole in our face and a hole in our ass and that basically motivates our entire life materialists are always looking at the dough and they pay no attention to the hole, but you don't get the whole picture unless you're looking at the hole and what motivates you, right? It's a toroidal field of energy around your body, which is a donut, right? Yes. And you look back at all these, all these mythological traditions, you always see this bull and they call the Taurus a Taurus for a reason. It's connected to that energy of, of the bull, this, this primordial nature, right? And that is where you get the idea of this, this uh, whole guiding you forward, right? And as occultists, we need to be looking at that whole because that's how everybody moves forward. It's like we're self-propelled stomachs moving along a, a train or a course, and that's that's where we're going with it. So if you keep that donut consciousness, you'll understand things like the OA a lot easier, right? That's why as Second, you're saying that, I'm thinking of, uh, what is that, podcast donut something, whatever? Yeah. Donut! I, I tried to Doesn't to, he say some shit like that? <laughs> I tried to talk to him about it, but he hasn't contacted me back. But I love the name. I think donuts are amazing. The toroidal field it's magnetism it's it's you know uh raindrops are in a toroidal field all this stuff are donuts and and nobody really knows about the donut you know but you got to keep that eye on the hole that's what it's all about i mean what was alistair crowley doing out in the desert you know he was going for the hole why is he doing that you know (laughs) you know what and i'm gonna even be totally honest with you and and this isn't i i will i'm i will always be the first one to say i'm sure this guy did sick and twisted stuff Oh, yeah. But I do think there is some some of that sick and twisted stuff. If you actually were to take the, your donut idea, you might oh, realize yeah. that he's not actually screwing anybody. He's just telling you what's going on with this field around him. It, uh, you know, and I'm be. not trying to, like I said, I'm not trying to give this man excuses. It's just I do think he did play that sometimes. I think... I think a lot of what you see in Aleister Crowley and a lot of other occultists is they have these subconscious desires that bleed over into their magic, and they think because they're so informed and so enlightened that they don't—they're not bleeding through. And then he dies of a heroin overdose, which is like evidence 
that he is completely a slave to his unconscious mind. That's what's pulling his cart. That's the ox. That's his Taurus, you know? <laughs> that was but, uh, uh, that was one of the demons that he couldn't shake off, I guess. There you go. You know, I've, I've even heard some people say that, uh, you know, about him, and that is, you know, as, as much as he, you know, was so gifted, I guess, with occultism, unfortunately, they think that, Maybe some of the things he worked with, he was not in control with anymore, and became right. became a slave himself, and actually just still thought he was righteous and all knowing. How much how much of an egotist did he turn out to be when he taught everybody how to get rid of the ego using meditation techniques? It's like, well, something's not matching up here. <laughs> you know, you don't you don't go out on the street and show off your magical power if you don't have an ego. Those two things don't equal. You know, and you know what, to be totally honest with you, I think that's why, you know, I, I do think there are, and not to sound crazy and wild, I do think there are like, um, you know, some wild, I wouldn't say healings, but I do think there are people out there that do have the capability of actually doing some supernatural stuff. But the thing is, is that they understand that like once I start showing this off, it's I'm not using the gift in the way it, should, it was given to me to do. Right. And I yeah. think I, I think I got an explanation for that too. We'll get into that later. I think. Okay. Listen. Awesome. Uh, second thing, there's uh, two types of languages, right? You've got the water language, which is pretty simple and straightforward to understand. Water is always speaking to itself, right? And then you've got the air language, and we all speak the air language, which is a derivative of the water language, right? And the air language consists of a cave on the shore of the water, right? And there's rocks in that cave, right, right along the edges. And then there's wind coming out of that cave. And there's a, a fish slapping his tail against those rocks, trying to get the attention of the rest of the ocean, right? And that's the air language. And that's what we do. The fish slapping against the rocks is our tongue against the teeth. And we've got uh, consonant sounds, which are formed from the rocks, and we've got air sounds, which are formed from the vowels. You know, I actually think that's what the the letter P, the seventeenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I actually think you, what you're getting at right there is actually showing you that. That is correct. This is what all the ancients were talking about. This is what um, uh, the megaliths were about. It was about the air moving around the rocks. Right? What do you think that's a symbol for? Uh, our fucking what was in teeth. The well, my, right now, I'm blowing air through my rocks. There you go. In my mouth. <laughs> and technically, that's, that's right. a projective male energy, too. Right. And what happens when you shine the light through that? You're shining knowledge through that hole. Back to the donut analogy. You see what I'm saying? So it's like you're you're taking knowledge in. You're pushing knowledge out it's all this exchange of light and energy and the ancients had it right when they were thinking about this and they were thinking about the consonants which are these hard sounds and then they had the uh the soul of the word which were these air sounds the vowels and then between the two of them it gets other people's water excited because that's what we all are is we're all water so you've got the water language, which is something easily done right now. We could we could speak the water language right now. On the count of three, I don't want you to say it out loud, but I want you to say it inside your head. I want you to say, who said that? Ready? One, two, three. Now, who said that? Was it you? Did you say that to yourself? What's going on there? That's the water language. You're speaking the water language to yourself. Other people are speaking the water language to you. You pick up on it. It's a vibe. It's the energy itself. These are the things that transfer between people. They call it affect, right? You can pick up on it. You can transmit it. People are always doing it. This is how you get subconscious signals from other people. Now, these are very important to understand because you can see these themes throughout the show, the OA, right? Yes, yes. We were even you saying see? that before in a lot of shows that, you know, I don't think it's just like this art. Sometimes it is, but I just don't think it's like, oh, this is just some artistic thing that has worked and we're just going to throw water in weird scenes. Just right. like Stranger Things. How many times is Eleven walking on water or there's water on the floor? It's supposed to look like water. Oh, it's right. just artistic. No, it's not. <laughs> I'd go back to Genesis with that, right? They say, you know, God created the heavens and the earth, and then all of a sudden they switch over to, and the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the water. Well, when did he create the water? Was the water there before him? And then you go back to, like, the Enuma Elish and these other traditions that the Bible copied off of, 
And what's before everything else? It's this watery darkness. You go back to Greek mythology. What came before all the gods? Well, it was this watery chaos, right? Formless, watery chaos. That's the water language. That's what came before form. I think that's what H.P. Lovecraft talked about. Yeah, he talks. That's what the ancient ones came from. You know, that's what these other god, elder gods came from. They came from the watery chaos, and he saw it as more of an insane thing because there is no form. And if there's no form, it's all insane. You know, how could it be anything? It's like a completely different dimension. And people try to say, oh, that's a lower dimension. That's lower chaos. That's low frequency. I think low frequency, high frequency, it's all chaos. It's all in there. You know, it's not something differentiated. Something that has the chance to even change is just chaos in itself. Right. Right now, us existing is chaos because my heart is pushing one way and then going the other way. Just that in itself, that's chaos. And it's constant pushing your change. Water. Constant change. I'm. We right. live physically in chaos. Right. <laughs> and and we're living in water. So these yes, two things right. are connected, right? And you've got electricity. They they measure the, the volts and the amperage as if it was water, even though they know it's not water. So somehow this analogy that they came up with is how they measure the electricity in the phones that we're using right now. So that's kind of a water language in itself. It's moving a lot faster, but it's the same principles. You know? Yeah. And then you got magnetism. And magnetism is in the water too. You got the ripples, you've got frequency, you've got light, you've got all this stuff. Like have you ever seen cavitation bubbles burst? No. Inside the water, you've got, when you move fast enough inside the water, you create cavitation bubbles, right? That's what they call them. So if you're moving really, really fast through the water, bubbles start to form around oh, okay. you. Okay. All right. Yeah. And what they've been able to do, um, some um, mantis shrimp, have you ever heard of that? No. The mantis shrimp is this really cool oh, shrimp yes, with yes, these huge claws, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. right? And they'll snap and create the and collapse cavitation bubbles. And every time you create and collapse a cavitation bubble, you get a burst of light. So the light is in the water too, right? And when you know all this stuff about water, you start to understand that's all within you right now. Like you are the cavitation bubbles in this infinite sea of water. And you're talking to all the rest of the water beings right now. And it doesn't take, you know, the air language to do it. It's just, that's the way we think. You know, that's the way we've been programmed. That's the way we've been enculturated. Yeah, you know, we could be connecting on a completely different level, but we can't because this is the way we were brought up. You know, if we were in tune with that water language a little bit more, I mean, we're all fluent in water language. We speak to ourselves in our heads all the time. But if we understood that it's not limited to ourselves, we could do so much more with it. You know, it's you know, it's funny. It's sorry to like interrupt with this bizarre thing that I'm about to say, but. You, the stuff you're saying. A few days ago, I think I was uh, I was talking to a uh, fan or a listener, uh, just about like kind of like weird out there like uh, occult ideas that I you know I've come across that just seem very out there. But there's some that I I do actually wonder, and one of them was, and this is gonna sound probably insane, but it, you know because you're going on about water being able to create light. I have often said, I wonder if our eyeballs are literally just flashlights in a sense. And we're literally projecting the vision that we have. And we, we are really are. going nowhere. We're just in the middle of an accordion. And our well, eyes are just making everything else. I know it's crazy. As that well, think about but when this. you're saying if the water emits create. light, I'm like, this goes with the eyeballs. Like, this actually helps my theory. <laughs> Our eyes do create the light. Because if, if you think about it, if you're not used to seeing something in the place that it's at you can look right over it a million times and never see it right that reflection is is kind of like completely missing to you because your eyes don't pick up that frequency you see what i'm saying so the light kind of has to go back and forth and they used to think yes this like the egyptians believed that light was coming out of your eyes and that was the reflection that you were seeing you know, and if you think about it, you know, everything with heat makes light, you know, ultraviolet radiation. Is it ultraviolet? Yeah. No, no, no. It's infrared, right? And ultra infrared is just heat. And you'll see it coming off of people because those are photons. Those are literal photons. We're projecting light all the time. Is that like, is what you're explaining, is that like um, when it's really hot out and you can look at the street and you see like, 
it looks like oil, like almost like you know, gasoline. You know, like when you see gasoline evaporating, you'll see that like coming off the ground, and you'll be like, "What?" The well, I mean, if, I remember as a kid, the, I thought that was like the most amazing thing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the the air is turning into water, right? Because of the heat itself. But this goes back to what I'm saying about the water language. It's everywhere. It is the primordial chaos before anything takes form. And you talk about the Scarlet Whore. What does the Scarlet Whore do with this uh, this water? She puts it in Takes it into herself and makes form out of it. She puts it in her cup. Right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So that she's the pathway to to the form of the world, right? You're and, fucking nailing it, bro. For sure. Right. So if, if you can think about things in a slightly different way, you can change the motif. And if you change the motif, you change the magic. This is the third definition I wanted to get to, is, is magic itself. A lot of people have their own definition for magic. They like to put will involved with it. But I, I take the will completely out of it. I say, um, magic is creating an illusion to influence reality. It's that simple. You can't build a building without a blueprint. That's the overlay that you use to build the thing. The blueprint is in the building, but it's, it's what gives you the steps to go forward. Right? It's basically the about, first step after the thought of the building. There you go. <laughs> right? And you have to make it work on paper so that it works in reality. And people say, oh, like like communism, that's a failed illusion. Every time they try it in reality, they're like, well, it worked on paper. If it doesn't work on in reality, it doesn't work on paper either. There are certain principles to every illusion. And you have to try things out so you can learn those principles. Right? So... All of the illusions that you tell yourself, those are the things that work right now. And mm. it's not necessarily true, but that's what works with the people around you. You've kind of gone into this groove. That groove itself is an illusion. And no. you can break out of that if you train to, to project past that illusion, create another illusion. And in doing so, you're changing the motif of, of your own reality. And in turn, it you know, communicates that reality to everybody else too, you know? So the way the Egyptians thought about the world was completely different, completely different motif, can completely different reality, completely different uh, illusion, right? You see that in every culture. They have their own illusions. They have their own motif. They have their own reality. And that's important for this show too, because, you know, they just change the illusion a little bit, mm. right? So I mean, I'll be totally show. honest with you. In my opinion, I even to the point of like the magician that's pulling the rabbit out of the hat, like I hate to say, but it's still that simple, really. Yep. That's going yep. on right now. Because like a lot of the magic is really just having people misdirected. What happens when they when they feel a sense of awe? You've changed their reality. Right? <laughs> so you know, even even illusions, even the, the prestidigitation, all the stuff that you do with stage magic, you're changing reality for other people. Instead you're of changing instead of it, it for yourself. Instead of it being on a stage, now it's out in the real world being filmed and then shown to us. Right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, these analogies we come up with for reality have an immense role to play in how we see reality. Right. And the way we create these illusions is through abstraction. Right. We take a concept, we either simplify it or uh, add complexity to it. And then we transfer that with our, our speech. And that changes the water of other people. Yes. Right. That changes their reality. That Just changes the sound, depending on what you say in one tone, can, to yeah, even can totally change. You can walk into a party. And depending on how you say probably the same thing, neither you'll have everybody being like, oh, hey, so-and-so. You Everybody would shut up and be like, yo, what the fuck did you just... <laughs> you know what I'm and saying? Using, just depending using, on the tone on the same shit, you could do that. Right. And using that in a tool, like as a tool, you can change the entire night. But you have to be willing to see that you have that ability. Right? And the people who can do that, it's called Charisma. You know, so they can go in there and misdirect the entire audience. And then they'll be the, the star of the show just by saying the same thing differently. You know, it's, it's, like they it's like they legit puked out an egregore. 
<laughs> <laughs> We're always puking out the egregore. Well, normally always it's done it. by multiple people because it's a huge thing, you know, but whatever, getting specific. But, like, literally, <laughs> that's all it is now. It's not even servitors because that's just, like, doing something small. It's, like, literally people have to talk. And egregores just get formed from that now somehow. Yep. Well, like, the, politicians the got that itself, down for sure. <laughs> every letter is an egregore. This goes into the angels. I'll, I'll talk about the angels in a minute. But let's let's go over the start of the show. So this girl shows up. She's getting ready to jump off of this bridge into the water again, into the water language. And she stopped on the bridge and people are like, don't do it. And she's like, I have to do it to save my boyfriend. Right. And it's like, what are you talking about? You're going to kill yourself to save your boyfriend. Doesn't make any sense. But it turns out she shows up um, missing and she was blind before. And they call it a miracle. So all these people are like, what the hell happened to you? You've been missing for years. And now you can see what's going on. And see, I even back think that hometown. stuff, no, no, sorry not to like cut you off real quick, but I even think the fact that she's blind is even like. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You could go back to the water language analogy. It's like it was before she crossed over the abyss that she was blind or no, she could see. But, Which she's out there, I think, technically she was blind to this world. Right, right. So, so, and, yeah. and that goes back to her story, which she starts after she gets back to her hometown and she meets up with some people. But she's really interested. I think his name is Bart, right? And she's so focused on getting this guy back, right? But nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows where she's been. They think it's all, you know, a mystery, but, but apparently this person who couldn't see comes back to her hometown. She can't see, and everybody is just sort of like awestruck by this person. And they don't know what to think. W did she run away? Was she kidnapped? What happened? And she's not telling her, her uh, parents. She's not telling the media. She's not telling anybody. They put the, the blanket over her head, right, like a sacred object, and they uh, hustle her into the house, you know, because to them, she is a sacred object, you know, she is this sacred object that's now back in their life. And that's really all they think about her is because, you know, being blind before being handicapped, she was kind of more of an object to them anyway. Right. Oh yeah. That's, man. You know, that's a good point. it was kind of their sacred object because yeah. you find out later on, you know, she was adopted. They couldn't have children of their own. So they viewed her as this sacred object that they would take care of always. They didn't know that she would become, you know, basically superhuman right in front of their eyes. And they have no idea how to deal with that. And that's, you know, another thing. It's like how she got there is irrelevant to the people around her because they don't know how they, she's changed her motif. She doesn't, They don't know how that she's changed her illusion, right? So... As she comes back, um, these restrictions that she had on her before being blind and not knowing anything completely changed the situation. And she doesn't want to put what she's been through on her parents. So she goes out and she's looking for Wi-Fi, right? And she finds this abandoned house. Well, before that, you're introduced to this guy banging this chick, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, real quick, just in case, because uh, I don't want to screw it up, but D-O-A, what does that stand for? It stands for the original angel, and, oh, okay. and she gets to that near the end of the uh, the episode, or the uh, series. Okay, right? no, somebody, yeah, I just wanted to clear that up. I thought original archangel, see, I screwed it up. That's what I wanted to ask <laughs> you. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, there's this guy who's watching her come back as he's banging this chick, and he's super ripped, and this chick is completely like, you know, screw you. This is just practice. You're just, you're a piece of trash and I'll never be with you, but I want to get good at sex. So, you know, and he's completely thrown away. He, he feels completely without agency, even though he's this ripped guy who looks like, you know, he could be the captain of the football team or whatever. I, I actually found that kind of funny. I was like, I was like, what? Like, just going, and you know, again, I guess maybe being stereotyping, but looking at his character is like, you're like, shouldn't you, like, actually be cool with that? <laughs> right. I found that well, interesting. Like, I figured he'd be like, oh, this is awesome. Works for me. <laughs> I think I think that character, the idea was. But that, he does change, um, though, and he, so he doesn't really fit that type, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, his, his father and, you know, the stepmother, he's always looking for love. 
people don't care about men. If a man's looking for love and he looks like that and he acts out, he's automatically the bad guy. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. People don't give a shit about men or, or how they feel. So seeing him act out, they're like, oh, he's a dangerous menace to society. Let's put him in the corner, <laughs> you know, and later yeah. on in the series, you see that theme pop up is like always like, well, why the fuck aren't you listening to him? <laughs> you know, he's crying out for help. And none of you people even want to hear it. You just see a fucking dangerous animal. It's the beast, right? He's the embodiment of the beast. I've thought that. I've thought that. Right. And that's, you know, the muscles and everything else. It's like he could destroy you with a punch. And he does to some people. You know, there's one scene in the high school where he throat punches this kid who's, who's a beautiful singer. Just to watch something that everybody appreciate go down in flames, you know, and he bruises his larynx and, and destroys his gift because nobody sees him as having any gifts. I think he, so nobody I think can his, have any gifts. His character is very much of a, like trying to see the prince struggling to become a king. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, like in the, with he the male energy. Know he's a, he doesn't even know he's a prince. Yeah, at all. yeah, he really. Yeah. He's a piece of trash from beginning until, you know, he starts to believe in himself. Well, you then know? you can the even time. take that as he's the abomination. Right. There you go. Yeah, he's, he's certainly he's certainly a satanic kind of character. But, you know, where's the servitors? He feels completely powerless. And that's what turns him into that thing. You know, and so she goes into this house where he's dealing drugs because that's that's his only form of agency is like, well, you know, I'm bad anyway. I can at least make some money off of it. She starts begging for Selling Wi-Fi. Wi <laughs> right. And the guy's like, get the fuck out of here. I'm making a drug deal. And she's like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I want Wi-Fi. And so he sticks his dog on her. And this is one of the greatest scenes in there. Instead of instead of like recoiling in terror or whatever, this this formerly blind girl that this guy, you know, clearly a bestial act. He sticks his dog on her and the dog just sinks his teeth into her arm and she starts bleeding everywhere. And she pulls that dog in close and starts whispering in his ear. And the dog completely lets go. I think she might've bit him or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Like, she kind of just like puts her teeth on him to, uh, yeah. Right. Exactly. And like somehow she's able to communicate with this dog without communicating anything back to the water language again. She's like, look, I know why you're doing this. You, you've been told to do it, but there's no threat here. I'm no threat to anyone. You know, I'm just like you are. And in essence, basically, when she leaves and she gets a promise out of the guy because she's freaked out the whole room, right? Nobody's ever seen. Oh, yeah. The other kids are like, what? A complete. Yeah. Like, she's completely helpless. It wasn't one recording dog, in it. I think the dude told him to stop because I even think he was just like, I don't want people to know this happened. Or right. Something like that, you know? <laughs> Right. They, they kind of witnessed a miracle, you know, and they had no idea how to process that information because just like that guy was completely powerless, even though seeming powerful, everybody else in that place was felt like they were completely powerless as well, which, you know, comes out later on in the series. But it's like this feeling of powerlessness is what draws all of them together. That's their connection. They all feel kind of powerless in their own lives. They all feel like they're they're completely, you know, without any agency. Agency, that's a real important word because it's similar to something else we're going to talk about, right? Okay. So as they're going through this, the um, um, she says, you have to give me Wi-Fi. You made a promise. And, you know, he's, he's so sh stunned, but his dog follows her out. She has to tell the dog to stay with him or else it's not turning around. That dog has found a new alpha without even trying really. I mean, so oh, we have to even think about that. Like even just even your idea and your theory, which I think is correct that she actually spoke to that thing. That may be like the only time it's ever experienced that. And it's like, God damn, right. <laughs> like, all right, I'll see you all later. Like I can, you know, connect. It's a, it's a different <laughs> level of charisma, right? Yeah. It's a level of charisma that transcends species. And that happens, right? I think so. I follow all it's, these. It's silly and woo-woo as that sounds, I do believe that happens. Oh, it absolutely does. You, you find people like that that have this supernatural gift to communicate with animals, right? It's because they're reaching out with their souls. And those animals can reciprocate that feeling, right? 
I, I follow this one account. This Russian guy has a whole uh, stable of mooses or moose, right? And they follow him around like they're his, his, his kids. And not only that, but he's got a crow that follows him around with these mooses. And, he, and he's just doing all this stuff out on the Siberian tundra. And these moose are just following him around and eating stuff. It's like, how do you get to that level? You've got to know the water language. You've got to be fluent in it. And that's something that you don't find outside of yourself. It's something you find by going inside yourself. You know, and once you go inside, you can recognize those same signals in other creatures. You know, that's the important part is you've got to go inside yourself to find yeah. out the water language. Water is always speaking to itself. If you, if you can yeah. meditate on that, you can get to anywhere you want to. So as this is happening, he makes a deal with uh, the, this beastly guy, this abomination. He makes a deal that uh, always got to go in and pretend to be somebody she isn't so that she can get uh, Wi-Fi from them. And, you know, normally you would think, well, that's kind of sketch, right? I mean, like she's, she doesn't seem like the type of person who would be doing something illegal like that. But at a certain point, you realize she's not pretending. She never had to pretend at all. Her ability to communicate past the idea of pretending is what got her, you know, through the door to a lot more than just this one guy who saw her, you know, basically take this bite to the arm by a Rottweiler and not and shake it off without a, a, a trial. It's like, it's that ability to communicate that use the water language that, you know, flows throughout the rest of the show, right? So she gets her Wi-Fi. He gets uh, his excuse. Basically, he doesn't want his parents to find out that he punched the kid in the throat, right? And the way that Owe communicates to the teachers by putting her on her heels, right? So she says, you know, haven't you been paying attention? This kid is is dying for attention. Nobody thinks he's shit. This is why he keeps acting out. And you guys won't listen either because you want to go along with whatever society thinks of this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in doing that, she waken she awakens the spark within that other person. And that spark is like, yeah, you know what? I'm a better teacher than this. I don't have to think of these people as being, you know, uh, out of control beasts because I'm the one who's supposed to be teaching them to civilize themselves and to grow. And it's like, she didn't realize that before that that was her purpose, you know? And, uh, the teacher and the rest of the kids at, at uh, buying drugs and buying hormones, that's she right. I uh, forgot about that. she tells um, that beast guy that they all have to show up at midnight with their doors open at this house that's unfinished so that she can tell them her story. Well, they don't know immediately about the story, but that she could talk to them, right? And the whole point is that so she can share the stuff that she's been through so that they themselves can, can relate with it. It's... This goes back to magic and illusion. The oldest form of magic is storytelling. You're creating an illusion that changes the reality within other people. Right? What do you think podcasting is? There you go. <laughs> people are listening. You know, I asked this question before. Who's the bigger villain? Is it Darth Vader? Right? Is it the uh, Emperor Palpatine? Or is it George Lucas for writing both of those characters? <laughs> right. You got to think about that. Like, what is what is being said? <laughs> what are they trying to say? What you know? Mm. How are these playing these things playing out? Because if it is all just acting, what exactly are they acting out? You know. So, yeah. anyways, back to the story. So, she gets them all in the room and she tells them about her youth, and she starts out with. Uh, talking about how she was uh, born and raised in, in Russia, how she lost her mother at an early age and her father was an oligarch before the fall of the Berlin Wall, before uh, the end of communism. And um, the reason why she lost her sight is because either the party or some terrorist organization decided to kill the kids of the oligarchs who were all going to private school together and they fell off of a bridge into the water. She was the only one that survived, but she had a near-death experience. 
by going into the water. And when she had this near-death experience in the water, she met a god. And this god said, I'm taking your vision away because what's going to happen is too much for you to see. Now, this, this god that she met, I, I believe it was a either... Uh, have you ever, just real quick, have you ever wondered, and I don't want to say too much in case people, you know, I don't want to spoil where we're going. But I have also wondered, was that like maybe just the way that she processed something that happened to her previously, just in a different way? It could be. I mean, I don't think I, I really don't think it got that deep with that. But like with other themes going on in the show, you almost have to start wondering, like, how real was drowning to her? Right. <laughs> well, one of the things that her dad taught her is that when you're feeling weak, you've got to go out. And you've got to do something to make yourself strong. So before this uh, this uh, bus was hit by the rocket mm -hmm. or uh, hit by the uh, the explosion, her father punched a hole in the ice and said, "Get into the ice." When she was feeling uh, when she was feeling depressed, when she was having these nightmares, and the idea there is, if things are bad, you've got to show yourself how bad they can really be so that you can be stronger than whatever's afflicting you at that, at, at that moment. And from that moment on, she never had those nightmares anymore because she was experiencing something that was so much worse. It's a very Russian thing when you think about it. I mean, the Russians are all about, look, if you're having a difficult time, you've got to make things worse for yourself so that you can realize how good you had it before. <laughs> very strange, but not not far off base at all not far off base at all so it's it's through that initial experience in the water that she was able to keep her head about herself as they were falling and freezing in this water and she was eventually able to come out even though she stopped breathing and transferred over to the other side for just that little bit of time now during that time this god takes her eyes away from her and says What's going to happen to you in the future is too much for you to bear. I don't want you to see it. But even then, you've got this idea of you've got to make things more difficult to see how good you've had it before. And this is all part of the narrative arc, right? You're moving into this unknown territory. And what better way to uh, symbolize unknown territory than blindness, right? So at this point, they also... They send her, she gets sent over to America. And in the process, her dad ends up being killed by the same forces that tried to kill her. But she's convinced. She dreams about it all the time. She's convinced that her dad is still alive and that she's going to make it back. So while she's in this orphanage over in America with this distant relative, or, or, I believe it's her aunt, uh, that's when you meet her parents in this story, which were actually her adopted parents. And they take her in and they feel like, you know, originally they wanted a boy, but instead of going with the boy, they went with this, this little girl who's blind because they figure, wow, this, this little girl will really need us. And that's why they wanted a child in the first place. They wanted to be needed. They wanted to take care of something, you know, so they went for the most, they had to take care of her the most. Yeah. Right. And that's, you know, sort of the symbol there. there. She was more of an object to them. And even though they were very kind to her, you could see later on down the line, once they lost control of her situation, they didn't respect her at all. At least the mom didn't. It's yeah. like, I've lost complete control over you. You know, now there's nothing I can do to take care of you. It's like, well, that's part of growing up anyway. Having a, a, a kid with blindness, it's almost like they never grow up. You always have to take care of them. Right, it's kind of a very selfish thing to do if you're picking a kid. You're like, well, I always want to take care of this person, but they had no idea that it would be connected to this other fabric of storyline, right? So as she's um, coming over to America and being raised in that environment and and all the rest of it, all she wants to do is see her dad. All she ever wants to do. So when she turns twenty one. She decides that since she's seen in a, in a dream, remember she had the, the problem with dreams before when she was growing up and then going into the water to get rid of them. In this dream, she sees the Statue of Liberty and she thinks, this is my sign. I will meet him at the Statue of Liberty when I'm 21, even though I can't see. So she goes across the country 
to be at the Statue of Liberty. And they've got all these grandiose shots. But again, it's this island in the middle of the water. It's a very symbolic thing, right? Well, I even think that's why they have the Statue of Liberty even in the scene. Absolutely, right? <laughs> the island in the middle of, of the water, but it's not what it seems to be. And that's a very, very strong theme in this too. She's like, well, I'm going to go here and everything's going to be great. We're going to have liberty once and for all. Everything's going to come together. But obviously the Statue of Liberty in real life is it what it seems to be? And the Statue of Liberty in the show does it turn out to be exactly what it seems to be? And so she she's waiting there all day, and nothing, nothing. And she finally, when she's finally asked to leave, she asked the um, the I believe it's a uh, the ferryman. I'll call him that because that's basically his role to read her the inscription on the Statue of Liberty. And I think that's a very symbolic thing, too, because that is when she finally crosses into the underworld. Like before this, she's on top of the world, right? She thinks everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be good. And then she literally crosses this uh, this river, Styx, and goes into the underworld of the subway. And it's in the underworld that she meets the antagonist of the whole show, this guy named Hap, right? And he goes by Hap. Because he doesn't really say his full name. Now, when he's when he's talking to her, he hears in her um, violin playing. He hears something that only a person in his position would be able to recognize. And he it turns out later on that he's studying people who have had near death experiences, and he finds out that there's something qualitatively different from near death experiencers from everybody else and for some reason he could hear that in the notes she's playing something more sorrowful something something from the soul something from the water inside of her that she's projecting out right it's only somebody who who really has experience with uh, near-death experiencers who can recognize this thing that's happening so as he's talking to her he's like yes i you know i i spent my life uh, studying these near-death experiencers. And I want you to come with me so that we can, you know, go study this thing together, right? And this shows a little bit of Hap's hubris, right? And he sort of represents kind of like um, a fallen angel. He's not, he seems at one point, he might not have been so obsessed, right? He might have just been a normal person who thought this was interesting, but since the answers eluded him, it became an obsession. And it became this, this driving force in his life. And that obsession is really important because anytime you find, you know, kind of like the fallen angels or the fallen messengers of doom, you always find an obsession. And we're, we're going to get into that later, right? So he takes her back to this house. She has no idea where she is. She's blind still. And... Um, He's been flying. He's been taking her over, over land. She has absolutely no idea where she is. This is the perfect situation for Hap. She doesn't know why yet. But he's taking her through these rooms. He takes her downstairs. And then all of a sudden, she hears other people. And these other people are, are, are yelling and hollering. And she's not exactly sure what's going on. And then all of a sudden, she hears the door close. And she's in a cell with several other people who have had near-death experiences. And it's funny because in the cell you see the water again, and the water flows between all the cages. And she's completely trapped at this point. And she realizes this whole thing has been a trap, and that Hap has only brought her in to study her, along with these other people, and she's completely lost hope for a while for a while now this this is where she meets bart and she meets all the rest of these people who are who are trapped in there with her and they all seem very uh hopeless as well like yeah i don't they I don't mean, even like her at first when she gets there right no not at all i and mean she, i i guess like i mean what's to be i don't know i i would think probably more people showing up would just almost make me think like this is never going to get any better 
Right. <laughs> so I that, guess I wouldn't be too happy to see more people showing up either. But being blind, there's the scene where she tries to drink water from this stream that's flowing through the oh. well. And it's poison because they're all washing up in it. And so she's gagging and throwing it. That's like the symbol of the discord between them. Their waters are not able to communicate. Right? And the entire time, the building of their relationship through this stream is kind of exemplifying how their waters are uniting. They're able to, through the, the movements, align their frequencies, you know, align uh, their waters. You know what's funny? I, I, did, st I, it's, I did actually think... You know, it's, it's probably a stretch, or maybe you'll you'll understand it too. I, I don't know how much if you're into tarot, but there is um, maybe the star card where it's like the the female with like the water like coming out and then pouring it back onto the ground. I even wonder like if that kind of played in with that a little bit as well. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now what you're seeing there with that star card, right? Is you're seeing beyond the the abyss is the star. Right, but to get there, you've got to flow through the waters basically. You gotta manipulate waters, the waters too, in a sense. I think you go with the right, flow. right, and so that's that's how our fates are manipulated, right? So you've got these um, the strings of fate from Greek mythology, right, that are cut, but those could be streams too. They couldn't just be string; they could also be a stream, right? And the stream flowing over the land and how it flows is its destiny and its destiny is to always meet up with the water itself you cut that it's going to flow all over the place it's not going to do it's what it's meant to do i've right? even i've even thought looking at that card and if you look at it in a certain aspect of like going towards you know the abyss you know this again could be a reach but like because we're so programmed that to think that art is done a certain way that nobody would ever think of that literally maybe the water is coming off and into the one hand and then going out into the water. It could be flowing you right know, through. It, it could actually be reversed, but we're so right. programmed to think that that's exactly how it's supposed to be that maybe it's really it actually going just back to where it came from. Right. right. Like it's, you, you could see, look at it two ways, and I think that's an occulted aspect of that card, actually. Absolutely. It's like the mirroring effect. Yes. The mirroring effect is very important because – Another thing about these cages is that they're clear, right? So everybody kind of starts to see themselves in the other people, right? They start to get to know each other, and their mirror becomes those other people. Her mirror, the one that she's most interested in, is Bart, right? Because they're right there, and she can see herself, see how, you know, she's sort of, you know, advanced and developed in him as well. And so... It's this bond and connection through this illusionary wall, right? Because it's, it's there, but it's not there, you know? And they're all sort of talking to each other, even though they're all separated. And it's kind of like these, these pieces of the same soul, right? And if you, if you look on the, the, the Crowley Tarot, right, the Thought Deck, you see these magnetic waves of energy coming off of the star, sort of like spiraling out. And it's that spiral that's representing, you know, the chaos of the original waters and also magnetism and also electricity. And you're seeing how all these things are combining in that that same star, you know, Aquarius. It's the it's the air sign. Yo, I swear that honestly, in my opinion, electricity or water is just a certain form of electricity in this condensed world. yes i swear i swear to, i think it is <laughs> and oh, it's monopolar right no, no 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 it's dipolar it's dipolar so when you put um uh water together it, i mean that's it why it's even the charge. flow the flow currency right. you know that's how money when you want to start getting i know somebody mentioned admiral laws before you even think of current and c currency <laughs> right. yeah. exactly. this goes back to uh, money, money is a water language. Yeah, that's what, what I was thinking. Like, think about think about inflation. What happens to the value of your dollar once there's a flood? Well, everybody's money becomes worthless because it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not flo flowing in its banks anymore. It's overflowing the banks. <laughs> and, and real quick, real quick, I, I do want to I do want to give a shout out to my 
my co-host who doesn't think that they're an occultist actually is the one who pointed out the currency and I was in with the water and trying to show me that stuff with electricity and I was like, oh, what the fuck? Like, this is coming from you. So I do have to uh, give a shout out to Teresa. As much <laughs> as she may not think that she's an occultist, she is in her own way. <laughs> and she yep. does catch some shit that, you know, she says and uh, it's pretty impressive. And I just repeated it and I want to at least give her the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, so I know if she's listening, she's like, yo, he just stole my shit. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many other other ones, too, like birth. Like birth. What What is birth? Well, it's a place where uh, ships dock, and it's a place where you come out of the waters of life. So there's lots of other, like the ancients knew the water language by heart. Like they were looking at the waters all the time. And what happens when you look at the waters? You see a reflection, right? And that's important, too, because it's like when you reflect symbols back at the people, you know, let's say you've got a sacred symbol, let's say like the swastika, for instance, yeah. and you reflect that back at people and you make it evil. What are they going to see in them themselves when they see the swastika? They're going to see evil. Yes. That's going to make them feel bad. It's going to change. It's going to turn what's, what's normally a clear picture into a funhouse mirror. Well, you know, right. And that's. That's the value of perverting these symbols. Yeah, I mean, like we're because you're making talking about before, we're just just in a word or sound, you can change just that symbol, change what, the whole meaning, change the whole what meaning, what it can do to somebody. Absolutely, who looks at it, what they get filled up within them. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a powerful and fucking symbol ever. It is. It like, regardless of like, are they a cult? aspect it's just a very powerful thing in the feelings it creates in people from looking at it okay well, you know? <laughs> this, this is a good time to go into another definition angle is the same word as angel it's the same word yeah why is that well you've got this uh tribe called the angli they later become the anglo-saxons they la may later make england but the Angli call themselves the angels, right? And they're from Northern Germany, right? And the Anglo-Saxons moved from Northern Germany over into England. And today you've got the Anglican church, all of this stuff. And the word angle itself comes from the Angli because they were fishermen, angler. But that doesn't make any sense, right? They called themselves the Angli because of the angels, Right? It wasn't because they're fishermen. That has nothing to do with it. When you look up the definition, they'll be like, no, it's because of anglers. It's like, no, anglers, angli, it came from the angels. That's what they called themselves is the angels. Right? And why did it change into the angle? Well, I'll tell you why. Because every god is a circle. Every human has their circle of influence. Every god has their circle of influence. Neptune has the sea. That's his circle of influence. Uh, you've got Zeus. Zeus has the air. That's his circle of influence. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you believe in one God, you believe that there's one circle of influence. If you believe in a pantheon, you believe that all those gods are a, a giant um, Venn diagram of influences. <laughs> and where they connect and where they, they differentiate, those could be angles. Look up at the sky. Where's the original angle in the sky? Well, I even think you see that with the tree of life with the lines and stuff. You know, I mean, I think that's even showing like reflections and ring or angles of light. Like, like what's I, the original angle, though? Do you know? <laughs> if you watch the night sky, everything rotates around the North Star. Yeah, that's okay. the original angle. That's the original angel. If you look in the Bible, the word angel is the same as the word for star. Yeah. It's the same. You know, I had... The original I had, angle. The original North Star. That's what she's talking about. The guiding light that never moves. You know, there that's was... That's the original angel. There was, uh, for, for people, like, listening, right, you know, listening to this episode, on the Occult Rejects, we do have uh, Symbolic Studies on. Mario from Symbolic Studies. And he did start dropping some stuff like this just with tarot. So I would go highly suggest to check that out. I just want to mention that because, you know, you're kind of saying the same thing. You know, he right? was showing it with tarot that he was thinking that there's certain stuff pointing to the North Star and all that shit. This is what I'm saying with the star card. The North Star is directly connected to the water somehow. 
How is that? It's the original angle. Now, I don't know if there's a dome or anything, but if there is a dome, guess where the out, out, out world is, right? You got to go through that star. That's the yeah. one. That's the one. That's the one that God comes through. His light is the original angle coming straight down towards the earth from the north. What do the occultists say about the north? We don't talk about the north. That's where the uh, the gods at. You know, at least the um, the Freemasons they shun the north. Why is that? Because that's the original angle. They want to have power over this world. They don't want to talk about the north. <laughs> is they want to be the ones to select the eon. You know what I mean? They want to be the ones to select the eon. They know that the eons are always going to change. They know that there's always going to be a difference in the stars. They know that these angles are going to change, but they want to be the ones to greet the new eon. They want to be the ones to say, we're in charge of this place. We'll do what you say, but we have to be the middlemen. We have to be the middle children of history. Because what they've realized is the first of anything is always the chaotic one. And if they can control the chaos, they can always position themselves in the middle. So the chaos can be beneath them, the chaos can be above them, as long as they're not in it. They're the middle children of history. And you find that over and over again in the Bible. It's always the second born that gets the uh, inheritance. It's always, you know, it's it's not, it's Esau that ends up getting screwed out of it. And Jacob, who lays down on the pillow and has the Jacob's ladder event, right? Something interesting Jacob's about that. Jacob's ladder, that's another thing again with electricity. Yup. I mean, and I was even going to say before, but, but we started getting off of it, but I'll just throw it in there now. Even with like angels, like you were saying, like angle. I even think arc and arc welding, electricity. Yep. I think there's, I hate to say it, but I do think that there's something there with that. There is. I, all, of, all of the stuff with magnetics all comes down to the angle that these magnets are facing each other. Right. That's how you get the right spin. That's how you get the the heat that you can use in uh, inductive uh, heating. And you can actually melt metal with the angle that you're inserting this metal into this magnetic field. Right. It's crazy. Right. Not only that, but if you if you put two electrodes into water, you end up separating the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Right. And together you can burn that hydrogen and oxygen that's coming out of the water and remake new water. Just like that. So no, you know what's wild? That that's almost like right there. What you just said is like separating the shit and then burning it and making it all over again. The purest that, alchemy. Well, no, the that is, you just summed up the movie Mother with the exclamation point. You just summed up that whole movie in that one line right there because that's exactly what you watch. You watch the Scarlet Whore go to such an extent that the separation they both burn down and then he just creates another whole scene. Yep. A new wife comes and we, the, we turns back to, to where it was again, but there was a separation and destruction, destruction and down and it went down in flames. Great reset. Right? This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to put the chaos below them and the chaos above them so they can be the middle children of history. Right? Problem, reaction, solution. As long as they're in that reacting phase, and making the solution phase, they're not touched by the chaos. They don't want to change. They never want to change. This is why they want immortality, right? So back to the show. So yeah, they find out. They find out what he's using them for, right? They find out that um, this is all about birth and death and renewal and trying to find the other side. Now again. Hap is a scientist who is a materialist. He doesn't want to actually experience a uh, near-death experience himself. He's a scientist. He wants to play God. He wants to be the middleman, right, between these people and their gods. He wants to come in the middle. Like every scientist who wants to be an observer, he's in the middle of the thing that's happening and the thing he wants to find out, you know? He doesn't want to experience anything. Again, no. the materialist is always focused on the dough. And when you focus on the dough, you make a lot more suffering than you really have to. You could do it yourself, but it'd be a lot easier to watch somebody else. Do you know, he do you wants think, to have this. What's that? I just want to ask your opinion. Do you think that like once you get even being in that position of what he's doing at that point, do you think like even even just doing that, that's already like gone too far? 
regardless if there's like even money involved. See, his whole thing was the purity of science, right? He has yeah. to know. And later on in the show, you find out that there's a whole secret society of these scientists experimenting on people, killing them, bringing them back. I don't know if his partner in the secret society was actually bringing anybody back, but he found this one thing, this whoosh, right? The whoosh sound. And the whoosh sound ended up becoming something else that he would hear some other place through the whoosh. So he would record it over and over again, and he would start to hear these other things happening, right? And in the process, he realizes this is some other place I'm listening to. This act of, of death, and it's, it's very Egyptian, right? They're escaping through their center portal up through the top of their heads, and then they come back once they're resuscitated. And that whooshing sound is them leaving the body, going to a different dimension, and then coming back in. No, so I've even sort of, I've even said myself from my own experiences. There's been times, and I hate to like I, I guess like maybe some of the better. I don't know, I'll have to use like Pink Floyd. Unfortunately, I don't know if they used it for that same thing. But there's times when like when their helicopter or plane spinning sounds. It's very much to me sounds that I heard right before some of the most extreme magical experiences I've had. Like that was another constant thing. I know I've said it before, but I do want to reiterate. It, it's almost it, as if, like, neither water or air flapping off of something. <laughs> like, it's a weird flutter. It's so fucking weird. But that, that was something that I have heard multiple times. And then, and then like, that happens, and I'm deaf. Then it, it stops. Right. And, and like, you're, you're an HD television. Right. Well, if you look at the layers of different uh water expressions right so you've got this chaotic water at the very bottom and then above that you've got you know sea water and then above that you've got air right this would be like you know from the very densest to the to the least dense right so the the air vibrations hitting your your ears you know you go a little deeper and it's a little muffled right maybe that's where the waves are hitting you with the uh with the the whooshing and the the waves right and then below that that would be the chaotic darkness. That's something you can't even hear, right? It's like complete sensory deprivation. And they talk about in sensory deprivation for like six days or something, you could, you could be in a completely blacked out room and then you start to have endogenous DMT events where your mind is creating these images and this massive hallucination just by being in total darkness and deafness your mind is starting to create with that chaotic darkness. Right? We think of darkness as very orderly, but it's not. Darkness is the potential of everything. This goes back to what I was saying about the donut. Isn't it funny how the whole and the whole, W-H-O-L-E, are the same word? From nothing... And the whole, everything. You see what I'm saying? Everything yeah. and nothing, all existing at the same point. That is the chaotic darkness. It's everything and it's nothing. It's completely formless. <laughs> and the emanations coming from that, at least in Greek mythology, are the gods who are shapeshifters. Right? They don't have the solidity that we do. They have complete control over the form. Well, you know what? They you know what's whatever they want. You know what's interesting, I, and this is just from my experiences. Like before, I get to something that actually, like, I guess, like, looks like it, it, I don't know how to explain it, but like, it will almost be just like this sea of like colors and explosions and just like all this wild stuff. And then, like, once you finally get to like, you've entered, <laughs> you've like walked into a television. It's, I don't know how to explain it. But it's like once that happens, then it kind of like it ends. Like the, that only that experience only lasts so long. But the other part before it, like that, for me, you can kind of flutter with a little bit longer. I don't know how to explain it, but like what you're saying, I I, I do see kind of like hey, it's moving through densities, right? Yeah, so and, I, and I think and I think why it ends is because I end up going into something that was like much more dense because now right. it's actually taking form, and now I'm just falling back down and we're going to open up my eyes. 
<laughs> well, if it's completely formless, then you're going to have all this chaos and then darkness. Because if it's without form, it, it can't have anything. Right? And so as your, your soul is traveling <laughs> yeah. through multiple densities, right? So when you reach that point where form no longer has a meaning, then you can understand, you know, what it's like to be with the gods. I was looking up today what ambrosia meant, you know, the, the food of the gods. And you'll never guess what it means. It means not mortal. Am, A, meaning not. Ambrosia, meaning mortal. Not mortal. That's what the food of the gods is. It's not mortal. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like if it's not connected to form, there's no way it can die. <laughs> Something in form deep, right that can it. die, that can change. But once it's this chaotic darkness that has no form, I mean, it's always changing and therefore it's never changing. Well, no, there you go. That's going back to H.P. Lovecraft. I right. think it was like the, 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 the chaos of the, you know, of the Alcraft. chaos of the formlessness. Now he viewed it as a horrible thing, but it's only horrible when you give it that meaning. Yeah. It's, it's really nothing. You know, when Crowley talks about conventional morality is for conventional people. Yeah. I think he got a glimpse of the, the other side, but he doesn't realize that that formlessness isn't the ultimate state of reality. It's not. Yeah. When you go there and think that it is the ultimate state of reality, then you don't give a shit about the people around you. You don't give a shit about yourself even. You'll go out there and overdose on heroin and rape a couple of dudes, you know? <laughs> but that's not the ultimate form of reality. Yeah. We're moving through our ultimate form of reality. We're mortals, right? This goes back to the angels idea. We're putting off angels all the time into our sphere of influence. Just like the gods, we may not have this massive sphere of influence like Zeus with all the sky, you know, or like Hades with all of the earth. But we have a sphere of influence. And if we're not paying attention to the angels we're throwing off, we're going to end up with fallen angels. The things we put off end up coming back on us and destroying us. You know, and I think, you know, back to the idea of the fallen angels, right? So from the center of the circle outward, you've got a ray. Right? That's what they call it in geometry, a ray or a line. If that ray or line becomes disconnected from the source, it becomes fallen. Right? Think about wood paneling for a minute. I, I got all this wood paneling behind me. Now, what do you see in the wood paneling where they cut off a branch? It looks like an eye, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. A fallen angle is a watcher, an eye. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh, it's always <laughs> watching where it comes from. You know, it's always watching outward because it's disconnected from the source. I made a video the other day about um, uh, one of the fallen angels himself, Kronos. He was fallen from his father, who is um, Uranus, right? And Uranus was melt, uh, melded with his mother, Gaia. And he was always penetrating Gaia because he was in love with Gaia. And the gods were inside of Gaia, and they couldn't get out until Kronos chopped off the dick and balls, chopped off the you know generative property of Uranus. Ooh. And Uranus had to spread off of the Earth and give us this this area for us to roam around down here. It's very interesting because you know a couple of days ago we had these Chinese balls in the sky, <laughs> and what did they do to the balls? <laughs> And what happened immediately afterwards? Well, in Turkey, you've got this massive earthquake. Now, what do the Titans represent? They represent the fallen angles that shook the earth. That Yo, came out of the earth in the same area where this fucking uh, earthquake happened. Yo, I can't remember. I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but it looks like they had a castration ritual and they're waking up the Titans, the original fallen angles. Yo, I, I can't I can't remember if it was last night or this morning because I did record another show this morning. It could have been last night, but I, I did make like a joke out of like, 
How the earthquake. I said, like, I had just watched Cabin in the Woods recently. Yeah, wow. It was last night because the chick knew exactly the year it came out. Um, Because she's, like, involved with stuff like that. So it was Cabin in the Woods from 2012. And, like, kind of the idea behind that was, like, that they had to feed these gods, like, these these older gods. Or, like, they were going to come up and destroy the earth. And I was, like, joking about, like, you know, Turkey. And I was like, oh, it's probably that, you know? Yep. No. <laughs> Get this, okay? You you've heard of um, uh, Alice Bailey, right? Oh yeah, yeah. She's the one who started all these new age cults. She started the uh, Lucia Society, which originally was called the Lucifer Society, right? They had to change it because people were getting upset. Now she could have called it anything. She could have called it Phanes, right? Phanes is the uh, Greek god of light that comes out of the Orphic egg, right? That's Phanes. He's light. He's the first. They call him the first king. This comes out of the Orphic tradition. Right, it's not necessarily in dot or from Greece. They think it comes from you know farther over in the Middle East, but he hatches from the Orphic egg, and he's the first light. So they could could have called it Phanes. Nobody would have had a problem. They specifically called it Lucifer. You know, Phanes is wrapped in a snake, right? That Orphic egg snake. He's wrapped in that when he comes out of there, right? So he's very obvious. You know, like if if the Hebrews were watching the Greeks, which they love to do. You know, he's the the snake in the Garden of Eden. He's the primordial energy coming out of that, you know, first egg of creation, right? And, uh, you know, they could have called it that. No, they went for Lucifer specifically. If you look at the if you look at the map of this earthquake, it's in the shape of the Eye of Horus. It literally is the Watcher, the Eye of Horus. The fallen angle, it's all right there. And uh, Alice Bailey predicted that the uh, heroes, her name for the fallen angles, would return in 2025. That was her prediction. So here we are. They're doing these fucking... Now, people, if you don't think that the military would do rituals like this, everything in the military is a fucking ritual. I was in the military for 12 fucking years... From the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed, it's all a ritual. And you're telling me that there's no black magic involved there. Bullshit. Bullshit. I mean, listen, everybody, if they wake up and brush their teeth first thing in the morning, that's a ritual. If you have that's coffee, if you have a coffee every time you get up in the morning, that's a ritual. You don't I mean, people don't realize it's silly stuff like that that's ritualistic. You don't stand in formation. And as soon as you go in there, they give, you, man. they give you their program. Right. And that program <laughs> is a ritual. And if you look back over time, every time before a battle, they would do rituals. Let's face it. War is a human sacrifice ritual. <laughs> These people are fighting themselves. They're sending other people to go die for them. That is human sacrifice. Period. That's the definition of it. So if you think they're not going to do fucking human sacrifice rituals, if you think they're not going to blow up balls in the sky, I got news for you. They're doing rituals all the fucking time. Generals and priests are both magicians. They just are. Let's just get that out of the way. America is no different from any other pagan nation on the planet. I'm sorry. You look at the symbols. You look at Washington, D.C. They've got a massive phallus in the middle of a Vesica Pisces. It's a fucking sex magic ritual. That's what they're doing. This is the nation you live in. They pass it through their secret societies. They don't pass it to everybody, but they pass it to the people they think have promise. And they do these rituals and they use you and they use your blood. And that blood sacrifice, guess what? That's a water language too. Mm. Blood sacrifice is a water language too. It may be evil and it may be wrong, but they're doing it. Yeah, they you know, I, I do think, and this is just my opinion, I do think. Uh, and, you know, and this was like kind of one of the reasons why I even say that I started this show is because uh, when I got out of, like, kind of, like, practicing and, like, paying attention and, like, turning on the TV more and, like, putting on, like, I guess, no normal TV and the news, I was, like, blown away by, like, how much occultism I thought was being used, you know, politically. Yep. And I was just like, yo, like, like wow, what the hell? And uh, it's just it was, like, really, like, I... I I really do think a, a lot, a lot of it is. And, you know, and then, you know, I, I don't know. You know, at some point it's like, all right, is, is is politics the problem? Or is it like, you know, just hugely influenced uh, with occultism? Or like, is that just 
a part of the magic that seems to be like working on the TV that shouldn't be in the house. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I think, like I don't know how far you want to take it, but like, I, I think it's darker than that. <laughs> I think it's a little bit darker than than any of that stuff. I think that um, the Greeks had this concept of fate, right? And that uh, their their idea of fate, you know, it's sort of like uh, one thing leads to another, you know, sort of like causality. But also at the same time, it's like mentality creates causality, which is that magic, right? So if they've got the the mentality of human sacrifice and ritual and all the rest of this stuff, it's going to come out in ways that maybe they themselves don't understand, uh, right? And that's yeah. their fate. And this brings <laughs> me back to Ambrosia because what do the gods eat? Stuff that is not mortal. Is history mortal? Or does history live forever? Mm. It kind of lives forever, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So what's it called when you when you do something great in history? That's called glory. And if you look throughout all these myths, what are the gods always reveling in? The glory of their heroes, right? The glory of the people on earth that bring them glory. And what happens when you try and fight the gods? Well, you get shame. So shame is kind of the opposite of glory. So you're out there seeking for glory or you're getting shame. If you reject their offers for glory, guess what you get? Shame. And that's no. sort of... <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'm sorry to interrupt you. What's popping into my head right now? And uh, I'm just going to toss that out there and maybe you might see it the same way. Uh, there's been certain Marvel movies where I actually think the good guys are actually not the good guys. Actually. Yep. I hate to say it. I, I really do think, like, especially Love and Thunder. In my opinion, that dude was just trying to meet his holy guardian angel, and the, angel, the other gods were like, fuck you, dude, no. Yeah. Well, the gods did that in Greece all the time. Like, when your ambition outstripped their willingness to give you glory, they strike you down in a heartbeat, you know? But basically, if you generate enough glory for the gods, you go to the good place. If you're full of shame, you go to the bad place. It's, you know, it's copied all throughout history. And after a thousand years in that good place or bad place, and you've worn off all the shame or you've worn out all your glory, they send you back to the earth. Right? Mm. So it's a thousand year uh, reincarnation cycle for the Greeks. But this is all the same stuff that you'll find in, you know, when they talk about heaven and hell and Tartars and, and they even call it Hades in the Bible for fuck's sake. Right. <laughs> so anyways, back to the <laughs> so they find out that they're killing these people over and over again, kind of like this Thanatos dream, you know, when you dream, you find a way out. It's the, they're talking about the golden age. You've got to go through, the water because the way hap kills them is he he puts this thing over their head that keeps all the water in he fills it up with water and he listens to the inside of their ear to the whoosh that you know of the soul escaping the body and when he when he records that he finds out that they're going someplace else and that intrigues him so much because he knows this is the evidence that there's life after death this is physical material proof He's interested in the dough. He wants to find out how to do it with dough. You know, he doesn't care about the spiritual. He doesn't care about the whole. He doesn't care about the absence of matter. He only cares about matter itself, right? And so they start to experiment with him. And the way they do that is they try and fake being under his drug while not being under his drug. And the drug of choice is very interesting. Do you remember what that was? No, 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 I don't. Devil's breath, detura. It's uh, it's this stuff that uh, it comes from the Boracero tree in uh, in South America. It literally makes you a zombie as soon as you ingest it. You do whatever suggested to you. It's a hypnagogic. Mm. That's very interesting because what is the TV? <laughs> <laughs> what is the TV? What are they doing to us? As soon as we ingest it, we become suggestible. Once we go into that alpha wave state, we become suggestible. We start doing what they're what they're telling us. This is how they're bringing us back into the state where they're experimenting on us to take us back into the golden age. I don't want to go into the golden age. This is one of the reasons why I chose the name Headless Giant because I believe 
We don't know where we come from. We don't know where we're going. And I'm okay with that. Every empire throughout history has tried to put a head on the body politic. All of us are part of this headless giant. We learn by doing. We've got eyes in our hands. We've got ears in our feet. All of humanity learns by doing. Our consciousness is increased when we work together, when we're not fighting against each other. And what happens when they try to screw this head onto the, the headless giant? We're all fighting with each other. So I think it's better to be without a head. I think it's better to not have that political authority over the body politic. And I like HG, too, because what is HG on the periodic table? It's mercury, oh, right? Okay. We have to be willing to adapt. We have to be willing to change. And what does mercury do once it touches another metal? Instant amalgamation. Instant amalgamation. We take that information into ourselves, and we become something different. That's interesting. HG, I didn't even know that. Yeah. HG in Latin stands for uh, watery metal. It's really well, because interesting. Because people always, you know, say instead of holy guardian angel, they just say HGA. Yep. And like, you know, Mercury, <laughs> Mercury, right, is right below uh, Tifereth, you know, where, where you're supposed to, you know, come in contact mercury with angle. it. Mercury angle. So <laughs> that's what really is the interesting. Mercury angle? How many degrees do you have to go up to get to the Mercury angle? And then, like, and if you even think of, like, you add heat to it and it rises. Yes, it does. Easily, you know, that's, that's another interesting thing. Yes, it does. And degrees, what is a degree? Right? It's an attained level of knowledge. That gets measured right? with mercury. <laughs> with mercury. There you go. It's all right there. Maybe we should just stop trying to put the head on the giant. We should stop making the golden age for these fucking people. And we've just got to be able to speak the water language to know where we're going. You're not going to get that from the TV. I'll tell you that much. Anyways, so Damn. Bart starts uh, starts faking it. And, he, you know, he's one of the most brave uh, death knots, you know, death sailors that there is because he just goes to his own death over and over again with this stoic sense of calm because he starts to figure out ways to get around it. Because one of the first things that happened is that um, the OA goes before she's even the OA, right? She goes into this death scenario and she sees this God again, this goddess. Yes. And this goddess is right in front of this pool of creation, this mm -hmm. pool of water where she could see all of creation expanding and contracting all the way across the universe. It's like the whole universe is right there in this pool. She says, you can stay here or you can go back. And it's, See, it's her I connection. Think, I think that was the part that made me think of the star card too. Yep. Yep. It's all right there. Because in yep. my thinking of, of just what I was saying with the star card, how I think you can see both ways depending on, that's how I saw that part, you know, referencing to that. You know, I could be wrong, you know. No, you're right. You're right. It's that that goddess represents that pouring of water in and out at the same time, right? Yeah, it's because it's giving you a choice, no right? <laughs> right. This is the form in the formlessness, you know. And she says, "You can stay here with your dad, or you can go back." And it's like, well, what do I get if I go back? Well, here are these movements, and these movements will allow you to free yourself. What What's at the bottom of Pandora's box? Hope springs eternal. It's hope. That's what she's offered. And it's the hope that creates the bridge to the place where she needs to go. And, and she says, here, take this bird and shove it down your throat. That bird is hope. That's the symbol for hope. She finds all this stuff herself because there's no difference between her and the rest of the universe. Maybe the movements didn't exist before her. Maybe she is the original angle across this bridge. You know, right? I have even thought, like, as cheesy as it sounds, I do think sometimes that may even play into the OTO Laman. I mean, they do have a white dove in there. Even though, I, even though it may also be something besides a dove. But I think, like, you know, because everything's got multiple symbols to it. I even do think to a certain aspect, uh, I know it doesn't make the OTO sound as edgy, but I do think that might be, like, in there. You know, that's a oh, part you of Oh, you want to make it sound edgy? Here's <laughs> a, the, the two best ways to control humanity is with hope and fear. It's true. So, there you go. <laughs> right? The devil of hope. <laughs> Why do you join? You've got hope. That's what it is. That's what Which way is the dove going? 
Is it going uh, up? Uh, no. no. Oh, fuck no. It's coming down. <laughs> that's hope coming down. You think you're getting out, but that's hope coming down. Sorry. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's good. what I can like you that. do? It's right there in the symbol. <laughs> All right, there you go. So, yeah, it didn't It didn't make it sound good. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I mean, this is the thing about symbols. They're a funhouse mirror. And unless you know how they're being distorted, you're never going to know how, how things are being distorted on you. You know? They want to turn you into something with these funhouse mirrors. They want you to see yourself a different way. This is how they get control over you. You know, that's you probably know? the best way to put it. When, when people say, like, oh, it was my experience. I should just say it was just a funhouse with mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it just it really sums it up, really. Tell you the truth. Like Unless really, like it was like like a carnival, with <laughs> carnival carnies, and you know, funhouse with mirrors, man. Funhouse mirror, and let's let's look at Narcissus for a second. What happens when he stares too long into that water? He falls in and drowns, right? So at a certain point, you've got to move forward in this reality, and you've got to stop looking at these reflections because it's maddening at some point, and you've got to say, "Look, I'm here. I can do something. So let's do it together." Let's stop worrying about where we come from. Let's stop worrying about gazing into all this stuff. Let's try and connect. Making that connection real here is more important than staring into the water at ourselves. You know? And having that movement forward. I mean, if you take the chariot card, for instance, I, I believe the chariot card is the symbol of symbols. Right? It seems like it's moving you forward, but it's not going anywhere at all. You know? Th those wheels aren't even attached. And those symbols, let's face it, at the very root of symbology, it's all a Rorschach test. Well, you get out what you put then, in. See, then again, like even when, when it comes to tarot, and like I, I do I do go by where it's, you can place it right on the tree of life. So yep. there's going to be, I think, a, a negative and positive to that card, depending on which way you're going up that line to get to the next sphere. So there, yeah, they could. I totally agree that there is a negative aspect also to that card because then everything's you're neither you're going nowhere or you're going down the tree. Everything's going up and coming down. If you yeah. look at the llama, you know which way they want to take you. Yeah. All right, and this kind of brings me over. I was going to oh, talk real about quick, that. real quick. I do yeah. want to ask. I want to ask you this. Just throw this out there. Um, I have you know on the, uh, I think it's the moon card. Now I guess it depends on like what deck you have. I have a, what is it, Magical Golden Dawn. Uh, I have it behind me, but I'm not going to try to grab it. Uh, you know, it shows, like, the pillars, and then it shows, like, the stream. And, and again, I, I really do think, even in tarot, water is electricity. They're showing yep. you that. And, you know, and it has a, a dog and a wolf. Now, I always, like, say it, like, joking around, and it sounds silly, but, like, if you if you think, like, if you think of the the water actually being electricity... Then my whole thing of thinking of the dog backwards and the wolf backwards, getting God and flow, that whole thing with the water being electricity makes 100% sense to me. I think they're connected. You've got to cross over the water to go from God to flow. Or you, know, or you even got to go with the flow of electricity to even become God or to an extent too. Right, but yeah. you see that that water is in the middle. It's separating the yeah. God from the flow. It's separating the flow from the God. That could even right? be like the. Sometimes I even think like if if you want to like even break down magic, you, you could say like shooting like electric and then like throwing a, a magnet in there. <laughs> you know, what it was supposed to be doing isn't going to happen anymore because of polarity being added right. to it. So like maybe that's even showing that in a sense. <laughs> well, again, the moon is the reflection. Right. So the moon is the reflection point between the God and the flow. Right. And that's separated by the waters. So if you've got the God on one side and the flow on the other, it's going to take something living in that reflection of God and flow. The thing that's moving through it, our fate is moving through it. And then it goes back to glory and shame. Right. Are we making glory for these gods or are we making shame for ourselves? You know, and then. Based off of where that moon is, you can get a reflection of either one. And that sort of changes the concept a little bit, but Yeah, I now, think I think they're, well not to get too too far off from the show, but even like you just saying the moon and reflection, I think that's a whole other I think those both go together very well when it comes to yep. occult ideas and start, you know, whatever. 
I, I think I think in terms of like the zeitgeist, the moon is what reflects that zeitgeist back at us. And as long as we're willing to live within this motif of reality, as long as we're willing to live within this magic, that's what's going to keep reverberating back and forth between the moon and us. Yeah, It's going to take yeah. our energy changing for that moon to reflect something different back down at us. It's like that uh, hundred monkey effect. Our fates are sort of all aligned. Yeah, I do think there's actually water. like some kind of like cyclical, cyclical flow yep. going between both. Yes, for sure. So, you yeah. know what, actually, if you don't mind, and, and I know we had spoke about this last time, uh, this would probably end up being a multiple multiple part thing. Um, if you're okay with it, maybe we could just actually just Absolutely. cut it here and we'll come back and do a part two. Because, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah if you There's so mind. much more. Oh, yeah, There's yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. You have, yeah, you haven't even gotten really yeah, too far into the story, really. This is like episode three. Yeah, I was going to say, you're only like a few episode episodes huge. in. Yeah. It starts off slow, but it's it's a creeper. It's so good. Oh, it's, and the music I almost gave up phenomenal. on it, and then when I when I stuck to it, I, and then once I started seeing him and the drownings and the NDEs, and I was like, oh, whoa, whoa! <laughs> I was like, now you got my this attention. This is a whole different world. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, oh, all right, I already know what's what we're showing here. Now. <laughs> so yeah, it totally caught my attention. I'm glad I did wait. If there's anybody who's you know comes who's listening either now or when this drops. If you haven't seen it, this is something that I do uh, suggest if you want to check it out to see what we're saying. You can give it a chance a few episodes. Yeah, for sure. And let's face it, they're probably going to take it off of Netflix pretty soon. I think it says too much. I really do. I was like, you know, I've, I've said that to a few people. I, I don't know. I may have even said that again last night. Uh, I don't know if it was on the air or off the air. But, like, I really do think, yes, I have said to somebody, I said, I, I actually think that show, like, Shows a hell of a lot more of reality than, than fiction. Yeah. You know, and, and, think, and it's not to sound like a crazy or, you know, that's like a some clickbait type thing to say, but, you know, <laughs> I just do think that, you know. Yeah. Well, it does it on a deeper level than most other shows get to, right? And if you're really paying attention, you can start to feel that on these different levels that, that are happening because there are different, you know, tears of reality that are existing and that's sort of like shown by the different people that she surrounds herself with is different ideas sort of converging into one it goes back to that uh that example i gave with the circles of influence right you have to align those circles of influence to make a pattern that's harmonious right that's what her goal is is to make those patterns sync up make that uh venn diagram into a single circle right and in doing so, that's how you move the thing forward. That's how you move out of one realm into another. And that's what the movements do is it syncs up all of those frequencies into a single strain of consciousness. Well, it would even be like taking the Vesica Pisces. I, yep. I, I, when the, and the, even the reason I'm saying that is because it's, it's funny. It's like I can never think of it now without looking at the Washington Monument where it has that you know, a phallic symbol sticking out, but it's sticking out from the middle of the I mean, two spheres. So now you're having the focus, like you were just saying, in between the both worlds. <laughs> yep. Yep. This is why it's such a sacred symbol to them. It's why they put it in all of their, uh, you know, city states. It's why it's in London. It's why it's in the Vatican. It's why it's in D.C. These are their city states. These are the ones they created. They know how to move it forward. We don't. We're not doing rituals on these levels. Uh, We're not, you yeah. know, because at a certain point, they're the ones who infiltrated the church and said, any power that you have is demonic. Any power that we exert over you is from God. That's really what they're saying. You know, I, I want to see Christians change the motif of their own beliefs and say, what can we do that's biblical? You know, how do we get to a point where we can express ourselves? Because let's face it, if the demons are coming through humans and you're opening that up in yourself. Why can't you open up a, a, a portal to the fourth kingdom? Why does it always have to come from the third kingdom? You know, according to the Bible, we're in the second kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. The fourth kingdom is coming from God down to us. And the third kingdom is full of the fallen angels. So that's sort of like the biblical sphere. So according to them, all these people doing magic are always opening up the, the third sphere, the third kingdom, and letting in these demons that are destroying the earth. Well, 
Why the fuck aren't you opening up the fourth spear? What, what the fuck is wrong with you? Well, no, because the priest does that or the priest says he does that and look at look at the vatican what are they doing they're opening the third sphere they don't give a fuck about you they want the golden age what they're you know? doing they're telling us we're not supposed to do right over and over again and what do we do? keep listening to them for you know i think i think there's magic in everything and we have to understand that while we're here it's okay to find it it's okay to speak the water language you can go out into nature and you can see the auras around trees you can see and you can hear different levels of reality coming from the birds themselves they call it the bird language the green language it's all around you if you're willing to listen to it read the bible don't listen to your priest he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about <laughs> he was he was trained Yo, to, be totally honest with, to be totally honest with you if somebody just probably read that and just tried to really figure it out on their own, they probably have a much more deeper and much more personal relationship with that. Absolutely. <laughs> They've encoded the entire Bible into this mathematical formula, right? I mean, and again, again, that, again, I, I do think it's deeply occult and you have to understand what you're, what, you're, what you're reading, but the problem is and where they sold the people that really mind fucked them is when they got sold that somebody else now has to tell you what this is. It's yep. already hard enough for you to understand it. Now we got somebody else to tell you that that was the ultimate mind. You can fill in the blanks with what they're going to say. <laughs> if you're doing something that we can't explain, it comes from demons because it's not a, a church sanctioned, you know, fake miracle. The church sanctioned fake miracles for the masses is us pouring, you know, uh, grape juice in the back of a Mary statue so that it bleeds blood, you know? That's their fake miracles. That's for you. That's the profane. They're the sacred ones. You're the profane ones. It's always been that way throughout history. Let's unscrew the head that's been put on top of our shoulders and let's learn by doing again. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I'll, and I'll just, and then, then we have to, sorry, I didn't have to kick you off, but I do have to kick going. But then just really to add to that, you know, what you're saying, like, I do think a lot of times a lot of stuff really is like so like I I don't say I don't want to say like everything's fake, but I do think so, there is a lot that people probably don't want to admit, and I do think I in a sense it is almost as if we're just being laughed at and like the jokes on us. Yep, because it's like you you're really eating it up all like all of it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. So before I go, I want to yes. give the audience a little bonus here. These are Spencer's Gifts tarot cards. Oh, that's they true. Are <laughs> those, were those the ones special. you showed me? <laughs> yes, yes. This one is the Warlock Magician. Look at that. That's something special. Let me see if I can find the... Uh, oh, oh, the Hierophant is the Voodoo Warlock. Voodoo warlock. Do you see any of the symbolism? Like this is probably going to be the standard deck pretty soon for all decks because they got to get rid of the tarot. You know, it says too much. So this is going to be the st standard tarot in a couple of years. You're going to love this one. This is the wheel of fortune. Uh, Look at, that. I mean, at least I got like one thing. I could, you know, do a few. Yeah. Look at them. what are they doing to this guy? Is yeah, that, yeah, but like because I know what the I you know it sucks. I you know what you know what the problem is though. Like for me to even, it's like I already know what the other one looks like, so I see that. But if nobody saw the other one, they would have no right. idea. So I can't. They would even, have no idea. This is I the can't. only one that's sort of relatively close to it. This is strength, right here. It's relatively close. You see the beast, you know, and the beast is doing something, going after a butterfly. The beast going after the butterfly. That's a good. Good symbol. It's close enough. Oh, here we go. These these are from the elements cards. Uh, two of cups. What the That's fuck cute. is that? It's a unicorn. Where's the cups? Where's the cups? I mean, maybe, at least maybe on her. Little... Maybe on her. <laughs> yeah, she's got two cups. I don't know the sizes, but they've at least got the little astrological symbol down in the in the in the corner. So that's fun. I'm stupid. I give up. No, oh, the lovers. Here we go. It's a succubus. Succubus. The well, lovers. You, you know, 
That one, believe it or not, because of the, I guess, again, again, you know, because of the deck that I have. The lover's card, I swear to God to you, she's playing the damsel in distress. And she's sucking you in and playing you. That could be. Yeah, she's that like tied to a rock, and it's like he's coming to save, and he's like, "Yeah, fooled you! Like you already got pulled away from your focus, and you got fooled into going somewhere you weren't supposed to go." Well, again, so I guess a succubus like it. that could work, Pandora. but again, but again, that's in a sexual way, when you could be shown it in a totally different way to make more sense. I think. Here we go. We got the four of cups. We've got this ghoul in a graveyard. I'm not sure exactly where they're going with this. But look, it's got the same astrological symbol because I guess that's the whole suit right there is, is they've got, you know. Oh, I was surprised they one. even had those on there, to tell you the truth. We've been talking about that one. Where's the dog? Uh, it's just well, we got a little, werewolf at least. Werewolf, yeah. <laughs> you, know what the, you, know, you know what the problem and then like that's the whole thing too, like that even with tarot. When it starts to becoming like sold like for artistic value, sometimes it's like then it starts minusing like the occult aspects to it. Yeah, there's there's a certain value to the positions that these glyphs are on, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then we got the Four of Swords, which is vampire. There we go. Very campy. No swords, obviously, other than the top little circle. But yeah, that's the Spencer's yeah, he's doing the brand. Sign of Osiris. <laughs> that's the Spencer's brand tarot deck, which is fun. Wow. I don't know how useful that would be. I, I took a look at it and I'm like, blasphemy! Yeah, I remember you said to me, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you you want to plug your uh, you want to plug your stuff again? Okay, yeah. Just uh check me out on Instagram and Twitter right now. Look up Headless Giant uh on Twitter, it's headless underscore giant. Um, HG, just remember that. Um, we all got to think about what kind of heads are being screwed on top of ours. Are we learning by doing? You know, are we listening with our feet? Or do we know where we're going? Is that Artemis <laughs> Diana you got in the back? No, that's there? Hathor. That's Hathor. Oh, that's Hathor? Okay. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see the. Oh, yeah, that's Isis. Isis Hathor, yeah. You know what? Okay, that's, well, Diana. They, they do. Uh, I do think. It's funny because uh, and then, then then I do have to get going real quick. Like Isis is like on in the Kabbalah is like associated with the moon, and then again Saturn. But I also think that Hathor can be very good for the Scarlet Horus Saturn area in itself. So I can see a resemblance between both of them, and even in an Egyptian mythology, they almost switched roles. Really, right? Hathor was kind of like the main bitch, and then all of a sudden Isis took over, and like they kind of like. You know, change their story. Didn't they say that uh, Horus cut the head off of Isis and she became Hathor? Oh, I don't even even know that. There's probably... uh, I'm pulling that from... There's so many different myths. See, that's the thing about the myth is the myth is a circle too, right? When you tell the story, you end up where you started from. And that's a circle of influence. And that's, that's where you get this idea of glory from. Is because once you go through the circle, then you're glorified. Now, just one thing real quick, okay? You've got David DePapi, the guy who who uh, brained this uh, uh, this this person. Uh, what's his name? Paul Pelosi, and he got in without any trouble, and he had the hammer in his hand, and he was able to smash through the window and go in there and brain Paul Pelosi. Why is that? How did that happen? I think he he was making glory for a god. I think he was making glory. For Thor, I think he was in there making glory for Thor. And then Yo, that Putin, that was that was him when he was in. Uh, didn't he get fat? What was this? He did. <laughs> Thor got fat too. All these symbols are making a Venn diagram, and he's in the middle of it. Oh, All that's right? awesome. You got Kronunos and that guy wearing the bull cap on the floor in January sixth. Why he's making glory for the god? You see what I'm saying? It's there. <laughs> These people are in the Venn diagram. We don't smell it. I've been to war twice. You can smell glory. When you see these people doing these things, you can smell the glory on them. It's something you only it's get when you, when you understand what that means. Glory and shame are right there in front of you. That's you know? Boy. Think about it. Yeah. These people could be possessed by fucking gods. Where did they go? These things are in our minds. They're in our in well, our 
environment. They're gods of nature. I do say they sometimes. They don't go anywhere. Sometimes I do think like it's almost like a radio station just gets picked up and that's it. Something like that. So, you know. Very weird, very good weird. Good to think about. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, your links will all be in the bottom. Your link that you did with General Lee's show will be in the bottom. Uh, thank you, everybody, who jumped in. Uh, I see Eric, we had, uh, I know, Her- uh, I think Helen was in there, yes. Asha, Fox, my man, Fox, thank you so much for jumping on and dropping a few mic drops yourself. Uh, what's up, Lisa? Uh, yeah, well, you know, you know, you all know who you are. Thank you very much for jumping in on the lives. That's uh, that's why I try to do them. And uh, yeah, and until the next one, uh, everybody be well. Later. Thank you. Later.